everyone. Welcome to the Veterinary Business Podcast, your ultimate resource for developing a successful veterinary practice or career. I'm Dr. Amanda landis Hanna, one of the co-hosts of the Veterinary Business Podcast. On this podcast, we bring you insights and expertise from industry-leading doctors, experts, and thought leaders. We cover a wide range of topics, including practice management, marketing, finance, leadership, HR, AI, law, and much more. Whether you're a practicing veterinarian, a practice owner, practice manager, or a student studying to be a veterinarian or veterinary technician, this podcast is tailored to help you navigate the unique challenges and opportunities in the business of veterinary medicine. Every listener of this podcast is welcome to visit us at www.veterinarybusinessinstitute.com for additional resources and tools to support your growth. You can also subscribe to our podcast on any popular podcast platforms such as iTunes, YouTube Music, Spotify, as well as many others. Today, I'm really excited about our guest. I'm joined by the incredible Martin Traub Warner, the CEO and founder of Vet Books. Martin is a true business mastermind with a knack for turning challenges into opportunities. With a proven track record of helping businesses succeed from startups to Fortune 500 companies, he's a master at building relationships and solving problems. Our topic today is going to focus around veterinary bookkeeping, which might not always be the most exciting topic, but to hear Martin speak, it is going to blow your mind. Welcome to the show, Martin. Before we get started, I'd love to hear your story. What drew you to veterinary medicine and what keeps you passionate about it? Thanks, Amanda. I'm like freaking out at the possibility of having to be like blow people's mind with bookkeeping. (laughs) Wow. I, I think that that's an appropriate expectation for you. I love Man. chatting with you. I think set, everyone's going to love hearing from you. Set, set, set the bar high. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks. So great to be here. And um, uh, you asked about the journey that got us here. Uh, so in 2011, 2012, uh, I was. Um, uh, comfortably playing in the marketing sales and marketing integration space um, and uh, tripped on uh, a problem in veterinary medicine. And the problem was that the PIMS codes uh, were not unified, which meant that you couldn't actually make apples to apples comparisons between practice management systems. Right. Uh, and, you know, 30,000 practices could have 50,000 different codes yep. for for uh for for each and every every uh product or treatment in their in their in their practice. And so over time we sort of chip chipped away and chipped away at that that was with my former company uh, uh originally known as Vet Success now known as Vet Source Data Services and we sort of grew this incredible team and uh, were uh, the first in the industry to be sort of purpose built for business intelligence and data analytics. And we um, worked with a lot of independent practices, worked with a lot of manufacturers. Uh, to this day, the company still works with a lot of independent practices, manufacturers, and uh, and corporate consolidators, kind of really helping understand what's happening in the business. But this this strange thing happened, which was... Um, you know, you, you put these numbers in front of practice owners and they say, well, pardon, this is great, but you know, you're, you're talking to me about my visits and my revenue, but, but how am I doing with my profitability? I'm like your profitability. I can't get your profitability by, by looking at your, at your PIMS, by looking at your practice management system for that, I'd have to get into your books, but your books are going to be done differently than everybody else's books and yep. quality varies and. And, um, uh, you know, you'd have to use the, you'd have to use similar methodology. You'd have to use the aha chart of accounts and, and, and accrual, accrual method of 
accounting and like for us to really get an apples to apples comparison. And so my clients were like, great, you should do that. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Yeah, 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 you should do that. I was like, uh, and, and that corresponded with my experience as a business owner, which was, um, when I started the business, I was flying by the seat of my pants, like was, I was broke beyond broke and, and my angel investors at the time said, you know, look, we're going to give you money. And I know you, th I love this, 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 my, the, the, the lead of our angel investor team, uh, uh, Mike uh, said to me, look, we're going to give you the money. And I know you think that that's what's really important, but what we're actually going to give you is infrastructure and support. So we'll give you a place to, we'll give you a place to work out of. We'll take care of all of your financials. We'll just, we'll do the, we'll, we'll give you all of the support. You right. just go and operate and build a great company. And like, he was so right. Like the money was important. But, and it wasn't like, it, it was, a, it was a lot of money for us at the time, but <laughs> it was, it, it wasn't millions of dollars. It was just, sure. it was enough to, it was enough to breathe a little life into the company. But that, that support that they gave me was life altering because it meant that I had financial controls in place. And then once I kind of had the business up and running and kind of smooth, I then took the financials over from them. And my favorite, favorite, favorite meeting of the month was uh, to meet with my team and review our financial performance against our plan. I'm not mm -hmm. sure it was my team's favorite meeting of the month, but, but, but to look at like, this is what we said we were going to do this month in each of our revenue categories. This is what we said we were going to spend this month in our costs. Um, where are the variances? Why are there variances? And to really understand the financials of the business as a team was massively important. So when practices said to me, like, you should do that, you should, you should, you should do our bookkeeping, the ability to bring that prom that promise, that experience to practices to be really hyper connected to the financials of their business was um was something worth doing. And so I uh joined with a couple of other uh, uh, thought leaders in the, uh, in the, in the, in the industry. Um, and, uh, and we, we launched this thing. Um, we were all, we were all otherwise busy and engaged. I, you know, had been, um, uh, I grew the vet success business. We ultimately sold that to vet source. I ended up working at vet source. Uh, so, um, uh, the other partners were, also involved in other, uh, in their other activities. And so the, the business was sort of slow growing and then mm -hmm. COVID came. Right. And so different than the explosion in revenue and stress that veterinary practices experienced, let me tell you about a conversation that no veterinary practice had an interest in having during those two years of COVID. Just like, Hey doc, do you want to switch your bookkeeping? switch yeah. my bookkeeping. What are you, do you, do you know what's happening to me out here? Forget that. Yeah. 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 That was definitely a tough time for all of us on so many different levels. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what happened during that transitional period. Obviously many, many things were happening throughout the world. Veterinarians were swamped. All of a sudden we're having to put completely different protocols in place. Um, you know, COVID, puppies and kittens, uh, you know, monkeys flying throughout the universe, all sorts of insanity were happening. Um, so tell me what was happening then with vet success and vet source during that kind of COVID time period and then in that immediate aftermath. So, uh, gosh, I haven't revisited that time in quite, in quite a while. Um, uh, that was a tough time to be a, to be a leader. Like, like you just remember the, before you get to all the puppies and kittens and all of that stuff, there was first the immediate weeks of, of sort of mid March, 20, mid March, 2020, and all of the uncertainty of lockdown and what's it going to mean. And, you know, we were fortunate. We had been working remotely for years. 
So, you know, people were like, you know, I just had my first ever Zoom happy hour. I was like, we've been doing Zoom happy hours for years. Like we had the, we had the infrastructure, yeah. but the, the uncertainty and the mental torque and the um, managing families and kids not in school and trying to do all of that. Um, uh, that was, man, that was a tough time. That was a really, really tough time. Yeah. And, and actually our team, we, um, uh, our, our, the vet success leadership team at that time, we kind of circled the wagons and sort of said, okay, like, what can we do for our clients? What can we do for our employees? And what can we do for the industry? And one of the things that we did for the industry is we built the uh, industry tracker mm -hmm. that um, uh, that that and published, you know, because everybody thought the world was going to end, right? Right. Um, and and we had enough data at the time that we sort of we put out into the world and published this industry tracker, mm -hmm. and that that was just. Uh, really well received by the industry because it sort of calmed people. It calmed people down when they saw like week after week, revenue was holding, visits were up, right? Yeah. Um, and you sort of caught the the early visual of what was to be this the, this you know uh, this boom. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in fact, it was the opposite of the world ending. So that's well, that's one thing that came out of that came out of that that COVID that COVID experience. Yeah, I love that industry tracker. Um, it's still continuing. I still get it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I believe people can get that through um, signing up on the Vet Success website. Is that correct? It would be the Vet Source Data Services website. Vet Source Data um, yep. And I think AVMA is still publishing it as well on a weekly basis. Yep. Yep. So there's um, multiple different places where our listeners can can get that information if periodically they still feel like the world is ending. It's it's quite um, reassuring in many different ways. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's it's sort of stabilized. I I I'll admit that in my ha having now left Vet Source and in my in my bookkeeping capacity, my bookkeeper capacity, I um, I don't look at it quite as much mm -hmm. because now, because now I'm really focused on the profitability of vet practices. Right. So like, yeah. you know, you think about the, the, the data we had available from the PIMS um, imagine now having visibility to all like to all the cost side and the full profitability picture. Yeah. It's a much smaller, it's a much smaller scale business. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not for everybody. It's, you know, it's, expensive to do your bookkeeping properly and not all bookkeeping is the same sure. um, by any stretch of the imagination um, which is a bit of a challenge when it comes to describing our service people aren't quite sure why they should be paying two or three times what they're actually paying today yeah to have their to have their you know cousins you know cousins boyfriend to do the books um uh yeah so it's a uh, tracker still exists and, um, and it's still good stuff. So let's back up a little bit to sort of that tracker and talk to me a little bit about that transition from the vet source team and what inspired you then to go more towards um, the bookkeeping and profitability sorts of aspects of the industry. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to be completely honest, it was a bit of a, identity crisis at the time i you know um as a ceo and founder and then i sat on the vet source senior leadership team for four years i just and and, and frankly covid kind of took the took the took took a lot of the wind out of me a little bit like it was yeah. it was just a, it was a highly emotionally charged time for me personally in my life um and i decided that I was going to step away and mm -hmm. I wasn't even quite sure what I was going to do. I started helping a, a buddy of mine who's doing ridiculously fascinating, amazingly interesting work in the world of um, IVF genomics. Mm -hmm. And he was standing up a company. So I went and helped him for a little bit. Um, they're still doing great. 
um, and, uh, you know, just sort of identity crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had started, we had started vet books in 2017 and it was of a size that you, you know, you, you kind of had to decide what I had to decide what to do with it. Like with the partners and I had to decide what to do with it. Like either you sort of give it away or sell it or shut it down, or maybe lean into it and see what, see what can come up, come up, what can come of it. Right. And so we just put a little bit of pressure on it, a little bit of time and attention and love to it. And it doesn't, it doesn't hurt by the way that people had come through COVID vet, vet teams were back at, you know, you know, hundred percent of the vet team working there. I mean, yes, there are still staffing shortages and staffing crises, but remember COVID days, they were tied. There were, there was a while there where teams were, were, were splitting in half so that if one person got COVID, the whole team didn't go down. Right. So, yeah. you know, we were back to sort of being open, being face to face, like, and people could start to pay attention to their business again. And so right. there was this pent up demand and hunger for understand for really understanding the financials of the business and, you know, shout out for the aha chart of accounts. If you're not on the aha chart of accounts, you really should be. It's hard, it's onerous, but it gives you the instrumentation and the granularity to be able to really manage your business. And people are hungry to manage their businesses. Right. No, they absolutely are. And so many of us had so many um, different types of loss, whether that's financially, emotionally, physically, uh, during that COVID timeframe that I imagine some veterinarians, veterinary teams, veterinary technicians, and hospital managers really came through that time period wanting to gain additional clarity. Obviously, in the veterinary space in particular, there were a lot more calls for work-life balance because the workload on the veterinary team members had been so significant uh, during COVID that I imagine as veterinarians and veterinary teams were coming through that, they were wanting to understand not only how to get better balance, but also how that influences things like the financials in a veterinary practice. Um, as we kind of came through some of that, and obviously there are still ongoing repercussions from um, from the pandemic and from um, really being shut down and so many individuals being isolated. Um, have you seen changes uh, in the veterinary industry that um, that really came through with the bookkeeping? You know, did you see turnover? Did you see individuals that were wanting to get a better handle on profitability so that they could potentially hire more? What did that look like to you from a bookkeeping perspective? Yeah, so it's still kind of early it's still kind of early days. It's still early days in the story of, in the story of vet books right now, we're sort of just building the foundation of, uh, of practices that are wanting to just, first of all, be under financial control. Like that's the first thing you can't, you know, but I, the promise that I make to, to practice owners is that they'll be able to sleep better at night because they know their numbers are right. They might not like the numbers. That's a different, that's a different problem. But knowing that the numbers that you're looking at are the right numbers is, it has to be the first step to being able to make a good decision. And if you're not using the AHA chart of accounts, or if you don't have full confidence in the financials that are being presented to you, or if they're being presented to you, you know, once a year after your accountant has looked at them and it's March, April, or May of 2024, and you're just getting a 2023 one-time look back of the whole year... You don't have that instrumentation. Um, and so, you know, our promise today is not to be sort of consultants and problem solvers in the traditional sense. It's we're sort of going upstream a little bit first and like putting in place the infrastructure and getting getting the actual picture and the instrumentation in place so that you can answer all of those questions, right? When you've got a clean PL. 90, 95% of your financial questions can be answered. And when you're getting that PL on a monthly basis, you can make a change today, you know, in month one and 60, 60 days from now, 60, 90 days from now, be able to see what happened as you made that change. And so having that sort of powerful tool is, uh, is really helpful. The one thing I was going to say is 
you know, um, the, the other big trend that happened around the time of COVID, it was happening before, during, and a little bit after was the move to consolidation. And I've got a lot of friends who are consolidators. I've got a lot of friends who've sold practices and are absolutely, you know, um, did extremely well for them and their families and, you know, don't begrudge that at all. But we've really sort of identified now this sort of um, argument that independent practices can be successful against their corporate competitors uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is if you have a clean set of financials, you can make these decisions and manage the profitability. Like, like we see practices, not a lot, but some quite regularly that are making, you know, operating profit of 20, 25, even as much as the 20 or 25%, like 20, 25%, that's a massively successful business, no matter what industry you're in. And if you can do that and maintain your independence, why, why would you sell? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a great point. You know, with, with consolidators, you know, they're looking for that type of profitability when they're determining what kinds of profit, uh, excuse me, what kinds of prices that they're going to offer to purchase a practice. But to your point, if you're that profitable and you need an exit strategy, why not sell to, uh, say, for instance, one of your associates? Why not sell potentially to um, a couple of your associates and sort of keep it keep it small and keep it competitive? Uh, do you find that um, these days you're seeing more small businesses coming into uh, your accounts from a bookkeeping perspective, or do you find that you've got more, um, say, for instance, small groups, like a couple of different extensions from one veterinary practice that you're seeing more often? Yeah, we see a little bit of, we see a little bit of, a little bit of, of, a little from column A, a little bit of from, little from column B. Um, you know, uh, it is, uh, and, but, but the one thing is for certain, like our, our business, the vet books business is specifically for independent practices, right? Mm -hmm. Independent practice, independent practices only. So we've got a number of, you know, uh, practice owners that have one, have, have two or three locations, <clears throat> um, and are running really big, successful businesses that way. We also have seen quite a few startups um, where people, you know, this, 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 this the common tale is, um, you know, I, I, I say, doctor, tell me about your practice. Well, I worked for a practice that I loved. The practice owner sold to corporate. We were told everything, we, we were told nothing was going to change. Wait for the laugh line. Ha ha ha. Of course, everything changed. Right. And now I want to go back out on my own to build the kind of practice that I grew up in and that I loved. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we see a lot of those startups and, you know, um, wildly different than my vet success business, which was a software based business. This is like a labor based business. So there's not that much room to be helpful on pricing, but like we try and help out those new practices as much as possible, because if you can help somebody, you know, start up their, their, their dreams, like why wouldn't you? Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and obviously, I live in the startup space, and I want everyone to have the opportunity to to come in with ideas and be successful. Um, are there common things that you find, whether in a new practice or an established practice, common mistakes, common things that you see time and time again that uh, you want veterinary teams, veterinary hospital managers, and veterinarians to be aware of? You know, there's some highly technical stuff that mm -hmm. that like technical technical bookkeeping stuff, like bookkeeping accountant accountant-y stuff. Yeah, and don't like, tell me to that. Be clear, stuff. Tell me the no, no, I can't. I can't. I'm, I'm to be clear. Like I am just a scrappy business guy who's who wants to help who wants to to help independent practices be successful. Uh, I'm surrounded by exceptionally talented accountancy bookkeeping super nerdy, which is said with complete love, um, uh, mathy problem solving people. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but, uh, but at a high level, you know, the, 
no, number one. I, I haven't thought I haven't thought to make a definitive list, but you know, among the things that we see most often is just not being in financial control, right? I've 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 owned my business for 15 years. I'm thinking about transition, whether that's selling to an associate or selling to to corporate, and I just don't know what's happening in the business. And by the way, for the number of practices when we get in there, we find I don't want to say we find what like like widespread fraud, for example, but we we have found instances where there's you know no audit trails, there's you know money's coming and going, and nobody's really quite sure where it's going to, where it's come from, um, and so just this idea like there, there is no substitute for knowing your numbers cold and for really being attuned to your practice. It reminds me that. Uh, earlier in the conversation, I was going to make the comment. Um, I've been giving a lot of thought lately, and I'd be actually really interested in your take on this. Um, when you're when you're reviewing your financials and you're really connected to the financials of the business, I I have a sense that you can attach a feeling to what that is like on in your day-to-day -day, in your day-to-day -day business your day-to-day -day operation right mm -hmm. it's like oh this you know this month was a good month oh right of course it was a good month so and so came back from mat leave um uh you know we had a full complement of people there were no holidays uh we did five extra dentals you know um and you kind of get the feel for what a good month feels like it's not a thing <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, that's totally a thing. Um, as you know, I was a medical director for um, a corporate consolidator for many years and being able to look back and say, okay, for veterinarians that are being paid on production, why did I earn what I earned? And can I replicate that? Or what can I change about that? For the practice overall, you know, being able to look back and say, okay, we did do five more dentals. What did we do that inspired that? You know, was there um, more people available to do more dentals? Did we get a new piece of equipment? Um, were we making higher quality recommendations to our clients? Were we, um, did we get a new technician in that really loves doing dentals and wants to talk about it all the time? Being able to um, identify that is incredibly beneficial. And um, for someone who is emotive as I am, you know, I do associate feelings with that. It's not unlike stepping on the scale and being like, woohoo, this, this number looks good, or this number makes me feel less good in this moment. And right. what changes can I make? Being able to um, really kind of key into that and then take a step back and say, okay, this is not just a number pulled out of nowhere. What's triggering this? Yeah. And being able to make better decisions not only makes you feel more intelligent in the moment, but it is associated with um, feelings um, and, and strong emotions because maybe there's something that's going really well. Maybe there's something that didn't go as well this time, but what are those opportunities to make those changes? You know, I'll share with you this. When you're watching your numbers with the granularity that a veterinary bookkeeper can give, can give you, uh, and we're not the only veterinary bookkeepers, uh, there, there are a number of really, really good uh, colleagues of ours to providing the same service. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when you're watching the numbers with the granularity that a veterinary bookkeeper can give you, there, th like, there's just, when you have a good month and then you have another good month and you have another good month and you know that it's a good month because you know your numbers are right and you're getting sort of almost real time, there's momentum in that. Like it just, yeah. it just, it, it builds. And when you string together 12, you know, good months, you have a mm -hmm. really great year. Yeah. And it's like, there's no, there's actually no, there's no magic to it. There's no mystery to it. It's all manageable. I say, to, I say to practice owners almost every day, um, uh, you know, doc, 
you're a diagnostician. I'm just giving you another set of numbers to diagnose your practice with. You might not feel comfortable with them just now, but you'll get there over time and they become a powerful tool for the health of your practice. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing as a data nerd, um, how much information you can garner from those numbers, but you're absolutely correct. It it feels awkward at first. It feels like, oh my gosh, I wasn't trained for this in vet school. Um, you know, hospital managers may be able to reference um, groups like VHMA, um, you know, vet students that join VBMA. There's so much more set up um, than, say, for instance, students like me that maybe maybe didn't join that particular organization and maybe reconsider it many, many times every year. Um, how would you recommend, other than um, affiliating with such an amazing service as yourself, where would you recommend, say, for instance, an associate that, that's maybe not in control of those numbers directly? Where could they start to learn some of this information so they're not going in blind when they do purchase into a practice? Oh, man, <laughs> I wish I had like... <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> well, time to go. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so I don't have a list of resources and maybe this is a cue for me that I actually, I'm going to take a little note here. Um, a cue for me that we should be producing, producing, producing more. I mean, um, there's a ton that you can read about just like start with the basics of like just the basics of finance. You should know what a profit and loss statement is and uh, or, or also known as the income statement, what it is and what it does and and uh, and how it works. Um, balance sheet, I, I'm an operator. Uh, I, I I don't like the, I don't like to spend time on the balance sheet. It's a super important document. please I don't want any hate mail. Um, but but the income statement is like, that's where the action happens, right? It's like mm -hmm. revenue and the cost of goods sold and the operating expenses and the, the operating profitability as a result, you know, it's pretty awesome. Um, and the sort of the interplay of, you know, what percent of your revenue goes to COGS, what percent of your revenue goes to, you know, non-DVM labor, what percent of your revenue goes to DVM labor, what percent of your revenue goes to OPEX and what's left as profitability. Um, just, just, playing with income statements if your if your practice owner will share the practices income statements which i you and i could do a whole hour just on open book management wow. um uh there's there's a ton 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 to think about there but i'm a big fan of sharing financials not necessarily salaries but share financials um uh you know, that way you get cl closer to understanding the operation and how it works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when teams, when teams ask for a raise, you need to have a conversation about, great, well, then no more discounting. Or when teams want to give a discount and they discount 10%, but the practice's profit is only 7%, you're actually giving money, out, like taking money from the practice owner, right? Mm -hmm. So like just sort of understanding the interplays Mm -hmm. Where to go to do that? Or, I don't know. Uh, uh, I think that's but, a great lead in to tell me, Martin, what is your website? How can people reach out to you if they do have questions about veterinary bookkeeping? Oh, oh, you <laughs> want me to point people to my website? Amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can find us at vetbooks.com. Um, and, and in fact, we do, we've got some. Kind of nerdy, actually, uh, uh, some nerdy um, blog posts on our website, um, you know, uh, why you should stop writing checks, for example, <laughs> um, uh, um, managing cash in the practice, uh, uh, why you should have a veterinary bookkeeper and a veterinary accountant and why those two should be separate. Um, we so should have a whole nerd... conversation about that one by itself. I, yeah, totally. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so many conversations. See what do you want? Oh. You want to, you want me to blow people's mind with bookkeeping? There's so much to cover. 
Yeah, we'll we'll have a recurring series uh, because I do want to come back with you at some point in time and talk about the benefits of open book management because obviously I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, I'm a big fan too. I got burned a little bit um, uh, by sharing salaries with my leadership team yeah. and that turned out to that that kind of blew up on me a little bit mm -hmm. um total totally my fault um but by and large like we shared the top line financials like the the sort of the 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 sort of bare bones financials with mm -hmm. the team twice a year we would say like okay you know here's revenue here's our objective here's here's what we spend in cost of goods sold to you know, to, to generate that revenue that leaves us, this is gross profit, then, you know, gross profit. Here's all our operating expenses. Here are the top five things we spend money on. And then here's, here's, here's the profitability of the company. And from that profitability, like, you know, we've got to, you know, distribute to the investors that are the people who put money into the business and, mm -hmm. and, you know, pay back my loans and all that kind of stuff. So and the more profitable we are, the more we can share with people. And if we're not profitable, we can't share with people. It is way more fun working in a business that's making money than it is to work in a business that isn't making money. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, again, <laughs> you know something about that, in, eh? I, I know lots about that. Um, having been on on both sides of the coin, you know, it, it's, it's tough being in a business that's not profitable. Um, and there's, while everyone likes to think it's, you know, just rainbows and unicorns when you are profitable, there's a lot that goes into that. And there's a lot of effort that goes into that. And it's not just everyone gets money. It would be great if everyone just got money, but there's a lot of pieces that have to be taken into account when a business is profitable. But when you are profitable, that gives you the leverage that you need to be able to figure out how to continue to grow, how to be able to um, investigate new new tools, new personnel, um, and there's so many opportunities with that. So um, I I think that we do need to have a follow up conversation about that um, in the future, so that people can really understand what are the what are the benefits, obviously, of being profitable. Again, it's not just cash flowing from trees, but how do you get the biggest bang for your buck by reinvest uh, reinvesting that capital? into your team members, into bonuses, into equipment. Um, and I think that that's something that you could give us some unique insight to. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd love to love love to dig into that. I think it's um, it's sort of, a, it's one of those cyclical topics. Open book management is hot, open book, open book management's cold, it's hot, it's cold. Um, I'm, 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 I'm certainly, I've always been a, a big fan and I'm, I'm, I'm hot on it again. I encourage people to share not everything. Nobody needs to know everybody's salaries, but there are ways to share information about the business and it just connects the team. It connects the team to what their day-to-day -day is all about. Right. Uh, I could make one more comment on that, um, which has to do with, which has to do with, um, uh, consumer expectations, you know, people, there's a lot of pushback on pricing, for example. And, 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 and I think, you know, teams need to be supportive of a practices, a practices pricing. And like, nobody comes into the practice and says, you should give me service for free. Right. So it's not like you're competing between like your price and zero dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. And so getting comfortable, like this is sort of part of the open book management and part of like understanding the profitability of the practice so that when they're, you're, when you're, you know, front desk staff is faced with the, the pricing resistance and pricing frustration, um, they're equipped to talk about like, like look around, look at the equipment that we've got, the specialists that we've got, the training that we've got, the facility that we've got the team that you've got, like, it's expensive to do this. Like pet ownership is expensive. Um, and, and again, pet owners don't expect to pay nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's really just closing the gap between their expectation and what the surprise, what the surprise was. 
Yeah, I think there should be a t-shirt that says life is about setting appropriate expectations. <laughs> Man, tell me about it. That's it. That's our second business. We're going to go into t-shirt making right there. Oh yeah. You make, you, 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 you're a good cookie maker. You should make cookies. You should go into cookie business. No, no, <laughs> no. I don't, don't start businesses. Stop. No, we're not starting another business. I, oh. I say, I say, which by the way, this is the second business idea that I've had today already. I'm like, Oh, I got another business. I got to do that one. Yep. Yep. No, I'm in the same boat. It's, it's so great uh, that we get to constantly ideate and hopefully our listeners have that same opportunity as well. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, again, thanks so much, Martin, for joining us today, for joining me today to talk about the exciting world of veterinary bookkeeping. I think you really did blow people's minds. I think we set an appropriate expectation and, uh, and I certainly appreciate your time and so much of your knowledge. I also want to take a moment to thank our listeners. We do appreciate each and every one of you. We cannot do what we do without you. If you do like our podcast, please share it with your colleagues and friends on social media. Also, please don't forget to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your reviews will help other doctors, veterinary technicians, and practice owners find us. Until next time, keep striving for excellence and making a positive impact in the lives of your patients and pet parents. I wish you all an amazing week ahead.